How much does EQ and emotional intelligence play into the average NFL football player making the team, staying on the team, and being successful? Man, it's huge, bro. Just being able to withstand the day-to-day -day grind and be able to take coaching, you know, have humility Ooh, to take good. coaching. You know, because a coach could be riding you, but he might be riding you because he sees the potential in you. But yeah, if you don't have yeah. that, you know, emotional stability, you might take it the wrong way, lash out, and you know, all of that. So it, it's really big, and I see it here in college as well. Yo, 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 this is Streetwise. I'm your host, Matthew McReynolds. This is, and we got a special guest today, Xavier Gooden. We go way back, but there's going to be, uh, there's gonna be a lot of value here. And I'm excited for this conversation. So, Xavier, what's going on, man? Nothing much, man. Happy to be here, bro. All right. Explain for the listener where you're sitting right now. Where are you currently? Uh, I'm currently in the player lounge at the LSU uh, football training facility. Okay, so, cool. So yeah. if we hear some, if we hear some banging and moving around, those are those are <laughs> some LSU football players for the most part. Uh, yeah. In the background, other coaches. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah. Um, all right. So there's a lot that we're going to talk about today, but I want to start and really focus on kind of your story and how you got started on this path. So big thing that I always fall back on is what is, what is that burning desire? What is this person's why and what gets you up and going in the morning? And I want to take it back specifically with you because you've lived out at a high level, a lot of people's dreams. And it, it seemed just knowing you for a long time, you knew for a while that you were on a specific path. So take us back to when you were you know, 16, 17, eight, 18 years old. What was your passion in that moment? What was the burning desire for you that has led you to where you are today? Man. I just uh, pretty much just wanted to maximize everything that God gave me, you know, try to be the best I could be, make my parents proud. And, uh, you know, I had a dream since I was six to make it to the NFL. And so I was just fixated on that and I put all my energy towards that. And, uh, you know, I just made sure I didn't get distracted and start looking elsewhere. And I just tried to stay on that path and do everything within my power to put myself in the best position to be successful. Oh, that's good, man. And uh, it's one thing to have that dream, but it's a whole other thing to actually have the discipline to lock in and not get distracted by all those other things, especially at such a young age. What do you... What do you attest that to? What what was it that um, that helped you stay so focused? I think it was a few things. Obviously, my foundation, like faith, um, that my parents instilled in me, and then uh, I think it was just learning from others. You know, seeing people before me, seeing the ones that were successful and the ones that made mistakes, and you can learn from both. And, uh, you know, I had family members that had opportunities that they could have played Division One ball and they didn't because they got distracted. And then, as you know, it was other people at our, our school that had opportunities, too. So no doubt. Um, I just never could wrap my head around like I just wanted it so bad. And I'm like, dude, like how in the world could you let something so frivolous get in the way of that, you know? Um, and, and, you know, everyone has a different story, but that's just the way I was. I was just like, I'm not going to let anything come in between that, you know, whether it's um, me doing something off the field, whether it's grades, anything. So I just made sure that I checked all the boxes that I needed to so that, you know, I can get where I was trying to go. No, it's good, man. Um, you know, there's a whole... Uh aspect of skill and talent and discipline and effort that you got to put in to be successful. What, what did that look like for you though? Practically like, okay, so you had, you had the vision, you wanted it more than most people. What did that look like your day to day back when, if you can think back to, you know, when you were middle school, high school age, still dreaming, not living it out yet. 
what did that look like? What were you doing differently than other people? I think a lot of people just do the bare minimum. You know, they're going to do the workout that's assigned to them, and then that's it. You know, I was always about trying to separate myself, trying to get an edge, and so I would always do more, you know. Um, I was working with other people, didn't even know it. You know, like, I was. I remember at home, I took a, a spray can bottle and a yardstick, and I marked out uh, 40 yards, and I used to go run, like, wind sprints with a parachute on, like, in my back alley. Yeah. You know, and it was like, my parents never told me to do any of this stuff, like, you know, it was just intrinsic motivation. You know, I just did it on my own. And for Christmas, I asked my dad for a weight set. You know, I didn't want clothes, shoes, or anything like that. Like, I wanted to get better. I wanted to get stronger. You know what I mean? And so I just kind of had that kind of mindset. Like, I was just putting every bean in the jar. And just um, So, yeah, I just wanted to, you know, I was – on Saturday mornings, I would go up to the field. The field would be locked. I would jump the fence. I'd go do drills. I would go run the hill. I would do stadiums. I was doing all of that. And whether it was raining, I, I would just throw a hoodie on. And you know what I mean? Like, it, it just became a way of life. Like, I didn't yeah. even look at it as, like, a chore or anything like that. That's just kind of who I was. Like, it was just just how I was built. And it, I, I know you and I, I remember you back then. And so that's, that gives context to the, my next line of questioning, but dude, you were already the best. Yeah. You were already, <laughs> you were already a better athlete than 99% of the people that were in our, in our circle that were around us. And I mean, we grew up in central Texas. I mean, there's athletes galore, but what, what motivated you? I mean, what what were you looking at, I guess? Because guys like me, I was looking at guys like you. I'm like, okay, that's my bar for success. <laughs> and, I mean, for the listener, the man that we're talking to right now is the reason why I got a fraction of playing time in high school and other sports because this guy was always first string holding it down. So well, I'm curious, man, to be already at the top, you – you have to have another bar that you're looking at. So what was that for you? Or did you just have that completely internally? Was there anybody that you were looking at or looking up to? It was a little of both. I, I wouldn't okay. say it was anybody like specifically, but I just always kind of had like a global mindset. Like there's always somebody out there better than me. You know what yeah. I mean? And, and I knew that, I wasn't just competing with the people at my school or in my city or in my state, but I'm competing with people all across the country. You know what nice. I'm saying? Like yeah. I had my eyes set on, you know, going to certain colleges and they're recruiting all over the country. So I can't just be the best guy in my area. I can't just be the best guy in Texas. Like I'm going to have to be better than guys in other areas too. So I had that in mind and then I had the long-term goal in mind too. Like I'm not just working for the here and now, but I'm working down the line as well. So I'm not going to always be in high school. I knew in a year or two, I was going to be in college and then I'm going to have to compete against, you know what I mean? Juniors and seniors for positions. And so I wanted to give myself a head start. I wasn't going to wait till I get to college to start doing that. Like I wanted to do that beforehand. So I just kind of always had that long-term, you know, vision in mind and and just never stay complacent, you know, because if you're staying complacent, you're getting worse because then somebody else is catching up to you or passing you up, you know. So uh, you got to constantly be moving forward. Oh, no doubt, man. That's a great, that's a great answer. I think a lot of people, they get caught up in their own local isolated situation and they miss out on either they get discouraged because they don't see opportunity where they're at or they get complacent or their head gets inflated because they're already the best at what they do in their mm -hmm. location but they don't see the bigger the bigger vision so man the I fact that you saw it. that yeah the fact that you saw that at uh at an early age is cool man that's a lot of maturity and self-awareness walk us through all right, so that, that gives us like a base level of where you started. Walk us through the process of 
you did get a scholarship to go D1, and then you did eventually get drafted. So what was that process like of continuing to growth? Like, what was the difference between high school and then college and then college to NFL? How did you have to level up in each situation and consistently get better? Man, I think college... I think college was a bigger adjustment than um, jumping from high school to college was a bigger adjustment than jumping from really? college to the pro. Yeah, okay. just because I had to change positions and, um, you know, completely learn something that I had never, you know, played at that level before. You know? Sure, yeah. Uh, last time I played linebacker was like peewee football, you know, and it's like pretty much just go chase the guy and tackle him. But... <sighs> You know, when you get to college, it's way different. And, oh, yeah. you know, uh, so you got to be able to read, react. You got to be able to fight off blocks. You got to, you know, know what's going on behind you and, all, you know, the whole nine. So um, it was an adjustment going from playing running back and, and DB in high school to now I'm in the box and I'm taking on 320 pound linemen. Like, that was something foreign That's a to me, big difference. you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it's so, a big difference. Uh, I had to really hone in on my technique, my fundamentals, uh, study film. Like in high school, I, you know, we didn't watch film like that. Like it's pretty much we just went out there and played like off of sheer talent. But when I got to college, I had to learn football like from a, you know, a uh, mind standpoint, being able to break down film and being able to anticipate plays and things. So um, that was a big adjustment. The biggest adjustment to the NFL is like the margin for error is very small and the game is just so fast. Um, so like one half a step in the wrong direction or anything, it's like, boom, you're out of the play. Like, um but the NFL, I, I believe it's even more so of a mind game because you'll see, and I'm quite sure you can ask your father-in-law about this, you'll see 9- and 10-year-old vets that are, like, slow and all of that just because their body's been through so much wear and tear, but they're beating young cats to the ball just mm. because they've been playing so long, they know the game, they're anticipating, you know, all of those things. Whereas a young guy is going to be a step behind just because he's pretty much clueless. He's mentally still processing yeah, everything. He hasn't got exactly. it yet. That's yeah. one of the things that um, my father-in-law will attest that what made him great was he put in so much effort into the studying that before the ball was even snapped, he already knew mm -hmm. exactly what was going to happen. And they knew that if the thing that he thinks is going to happen doesn't, then that means there's only one other thing that could happen. So he right. was instantly able to know the exact play, which we might have already answered. So me asking might be redundant. Obviously, you don't make it to the NFL without being an extreme athlete. But what I think people miss is the mentality that goes into it and the level of professionalism that you have to fall back on. What... Um, but there's a lot of great athletes out there. So I, I right. guess I'll just ask it like this. Is it more of the athleticism or is it more of the mindset? And maybe maybe try to put it into a, a percentages, like studiousness versus the actual athleticism. What makes the biggest difference? Man, I think IQ is very important. Um, I will say this. There's like... 10% of the NFL that's their talent is superior. They're on a whole nother level. They're just and I would, way I, different yeah, than everybody you know, else. So, so those are like the JJ by God. And Von Millers, the Adrian Petersons, like the, you know, super pro bowl hall of fame, like top sure. 10%. Yeah. The other 90% of the NFL talent is basically the same. You know what I mean? Um, and so I think the thing that separates them is uh, consistency, um, you know, building trust with the coaches. Like, I know there's like, there were like third string players that were just as good as starters on some teams that I was with. But the only difference was they would have a couple more mental errors 
and so the coaches didn't trust them as much. Sure. Or they were just not as consistent. They will have a really good game and then, you know, they'll have like a bad game or an yeah. average game. Whereas another guy, you just knew what you were going to get from him. He was going to stay the same throughout the entire season. So the the margin of separation is, I mean, it's fractions, man. It's like very, very slim. Um, but IQ plays a role in that. You know, some guys, most guys are professionals, um, but the guys who understand the game, who can anticipate things that, that know – what's going on, not just their job, but what's going on around them and and how their piece of the puzzle fits to the rest of them. Those are typically the guys that stick around for a really long time. Mm, no, that makes a lot of sense because, I mean, football especially, but anytime you're on a team, you really have to understand what every person's role is. And if you don't right. understand your role or another person right next to you, you're really a liability. I mean, am I right? Like you, things can go wrong quickly. Um, mm. You talked about IQ, something that I talk about a lot on this podcast, but is important to me is EQ. So emotional intelligence, being able to withstand <laughs> adversity and interacting with other people. And a lot of, a lot of listeners, a lot of uh, civilians, they only see what they see on sports center on they only hear about you know the big the big stuff but how much does mm -hmm. eq and emotional intelligence play into the average nfl football player making the team staying on the team and being successful man it's huge bro um just being able to withstand the day-to-day -day grind and yeah i bet. be able to take coaching you know, have hu humility Ooh, to take good. coaching, you know, because a coach could be riding you, but he might be riding you because he sees the potential in you. But yeah, if you don't have yeah. that, you know, emotional stability, you might take it the wrong way and lash out and, you know, all of that. So um, it, it's really big. And I see it here in college as well. You know, some guys are mature enough where, um, they can battle through things and other guys, they can't, you know, let, let's take a DB for instance, let's say he has perfect coverage and it's a third and long. He has perfect coverage, but then the ref throws a flag when he really Ooh. didn't commit a penalty. Right. Like, do you have that emotional stability to line up the next play and just forget about that and say, okay, let's reset. Oh, let's, great. you know what I mean? Yeah, or are you going to let that play affect your next play and still dwell on it? And then all of a sudden you're giving up are another big play. Are you right. shook? Yeah, exactly. And so um, that, that separates guys, even at the college level, you know, um, or you could be battling with the guy during training camp and you might not win the spot. You may have done everything you could do. You might not win the spot. Are you going to be the guy that starts pouting and whining and shutting it down? Or are you going to be a guy that keeps working his craft, even though they're on scout team and tries to get better? You know what I mean? So, and, and that happened to me. Like my freshman year, I red shirted. I felt like I deserved to play, but I didn't. But I had a chip on my shoulder and I approached scout team like it was a game. You know what I mean? And I gave the offense the best look possible. And I was using them to give me a look because I'm guarding first team, you know, offense. I'm covering Jeremy Macklin, who was a first round receiver. I'm covering Chase Kaufman, who was a third round tight end. So I was like, I'm going to use them to get better because if I can cover these guys, you know, then I know whenever my time does come, then I'll be ready for it. You know, Man. but some guys didn't take that same approach. They were whining, complaining, and, 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 you know, they would just do the bare minimum just not to get yelled at instead of trying to get, you know, get better and work their craft. And you could see guys that ended up the next year playing and the guys that didn't. So um, it's a lot that college athletes go through, you know, uh, dealing with school, you know. Uh, they got some crazy schedules. Um but it's just having that emotional stability to do it day in and day out, you know, no matter what's going on, you got personal things going on. Um, just being able to block all that stuff out and stay focused and stay present in the moment 
and handle what you got to handle. And then when it's over with, then you can deal with the rest. Oh, that's good, man. I just think back on, um, I played division three football, so much smaller, but similar uh, structure and concepts that you're talking about. And I played a lot more my freshman year than I did my sophomore and junior year because of injuries. And so when I was healthy again, I spent a lot of time on that scout team and, and hindsight is crazy because it's always 2020. You got better vision when you can look back, but man, what better way to get better and to improve in your craft, especially when you got a chip on your shoulder, when you got an opportunity to go up against the best on the squad on the opposite mm. side, even though you're not getting, you know, the glory, man, I look back and there's such good opportunities for growth that sometimes I took advantage of it. And then sometimes I squandered the opportunity and um, that could be applicable anywhere. So I've got, I've got a couple different ways I want to take it at this point. That's a ton of value right now that people can take, whether they're athletes, whether they're building their career, whether they're entrepreneurs. So let's go back. And as your high school, college, NFL, what were some of the biggest obstacles that you came across that you had to push through and overcome on that journey within that window of your life? Um, I would say red shirted was big just because it was crazy because my, my position coach, he told me the week before that I was going to play. Mm. And, uh, so, you know, I was super excited and I had a really good camp. And then the next week he told me I was red shirting and, you know, that's the first time since I was six years old that I wasn't going to be playing. You know what I mean? Wow. And so um, I think it made it even tougher to accept just because I had already kind of put it in my head that I was going to be playing because yeah, he told no me doubt. that. And then it was like he kind of came back and was like, well, actually, we think it's best if, you know. And, and I understood the reasoning behind it. But um, I think that was a, a great moment for me because – like you said, it was a, a moment for growth. So, like, whenever you're redshirted um, in season, you have, like, extra lifting sessions that the other guys don't have because, you know, they're playing. So they still develop the guys that are redshirted, you know. And so I used to just go crazy in those lifts, man. Like, and they, <laughs> and they used to have us doing some, some very <laughs> tough stuff, some crazy yeah. stuff, man. But, um you know, like I said, I just had a chip on my shoulder and I was like, never again, you know, like yeah. n next year when this opportunity rolls around, I'm not missing it. Like, it, you know, I'm going to be the starter next year for sure. So I just I just went crazy. And I think that kind of laid a good foundation for me. And then once I got to the league, man, just. Um, I had tore my hamstring and ruptured a tendon off the bone. And so I had to have surgery. So you remember that because I remember. Yeah, you I came to Dallas. You kicked yeah. it with me for a little bit. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I'll never forget that. <laughs> and so, you know, one of the great assets about me was my speed as a backer. And so then it was tough trying to battle back from that because wow. like that first year back, my speed wasn't quite the same. You know what I mean? Like, and then I was also afraid to kind of push it to that level because yeah, I've been there, no doubt. I knew like if I got hurt, then I was gonna get cut. So then I was weighing like, man, should I even try to kick it in that last gear? Because like mm. if something does happen, like I'm not gonna be on the team no more, you know. And and then once that happened, I started you know kind of bouncing around, and so you're just the bottom guy on the roster just trying to fight for a job every single year you know and that just kind of uh became exhausting you know because you could grade out better than other guys that are in front of you but they already paid this dude a big contract mm -hmm. so and they're not about this dude there. already got 10 million dollars you know they're gonna they're gonna keep him around because they've already paid him you know, so it really doesn't matter what he does at this point unless he's just playing that terrible, you know what I mean? So it was just the constant fight, the constant battle, and then that one injury started leading to other injuries, you know. Um, 
So just trying to keep my hold on to the love for the game became difficult, you know, because when you're hurting every single day at practice, like, you know, and your body just is just failing you to a certain extent, like, uh, it's just difficult, you know, doing it for six, 17 weeks, you know what I mean? Plus the training camp. So, um, that became very challenging for me and, and, the love for the game kind of started dwindling and I, and I could feel it. And so um, I'm the type of person, like I'm not going to do anything if my full heart isn't in it. And so I could just tell, like, I just wasn't the same. Plus I I had got a really bad concussion at one point and it just kind of seemed like, you know, it was, it was coming towards that time. So, uh, I could just kind of see like the ending coming sooner than what I had anticipated, basically. So that that was tough to accept just because I had a vision for how my career in the NFL would go. And then it, you know, went awry. It didn't go that way. Um, but in the end, you know, God was with me the entire time and it was a tremendous blessing. I got vested. Um, and so it was an opportunity I'll never forget. And I'm, I'll always be grateful for it. Wow, man. There's a lot there. Um, so it, it eventually came to a point where your body is struggling to maintain and that affected your mind and even your love. So for what I'm hearing, and you can correct me cause I want to, I want to eventually turn this back into a question, but, um, it got to a point where love started to dwindle and then you had to make a choice of, do I keep doing this or do I just cut it and pivot? Is that, is that right? Uh, somewhat. So okay. my last year in Arizona, I got released and then, um, we were expecting my first child. And so I got another call and, um, was it, it was Jacksonville. So Jacksonville called me and they were like, yo, we want to bring you out uh, for a workout. We want to make sure, you know, everything is good, but you have a very high chance of being signed if you come. And so the workout was actually like the, on the same day as my son's due date. And so then, you know, I'm like, talking it over with my wife and stuff. I'm like, this is my first child. I don't want to miss, you know, my son's birth. We didn't know if it was a boy or girl then, but uh, I I didn't want to miss the birth. And I prayed about it and and I stayed and I knew that there was a chance that I would never get a call again, you know, but I prayed about it and I was like, God, if, if it's meant to be, just give me another opportunity. If not, then, you know, I'll accept it. And I never got another call. So um, I guess that was, you know, my hand kind of got forced. But at the same time, you know, I was I was kind of feeling that way anyway. So confirmation from God that it was was time to move on. You know, it's crazy how God will. It just seems like we get put in these situations where it is a very clear crossroad and we might not Mm. always be ready for such a clearly defined crossroad when you get put in this situation that whatever you choose is going to be a defining moment for your life. Those moments are, man, they're so pivotal to our, our growth and our journey. And if you're in tune and you're listening and, you know, some people might have different uh, religious uh, philosophies and theologies, but if you're in tune with the voice of God, the Holy Spirit, and and you can act out of that, it's crazy. Just it might not look pretty, but it's crazy the blessings that can that can come out of that with the right heart. I guess absolutely. Is, is what I'm trying to say. Um, before we before we kind of switch switch gears. Um, Maybe explain to us, because this is a good time to plug this in. A lot of people don't really understand the business side of 
football, professional football, and now probably even college football. I got a taste of that when I was in Memphis working for uh, the Memphis Express, the Spring League, the Alliance of American Football back in 2019 and seeing guys come in and do workouts and or maybe play for a few weeks, then get cut, only to get replaced by somebody else. And mm. what um, what do most people not get at all about the business side of professional sports? Man, um, I think they don't understand. I think they think like, the same players stay on the team like throughout the year, you know, but they don't understand that guys are constantly getting replaced throughout the entire season. Like I remember in 2014, my second year in Tennessee, I mean, we just had a terrible year. <laughs> so <laughs> we went two and 14. Okay. And I mean, half the roster was different by the end of the year, you know, wow. out of those 53 guys, maybe, Maybe 30 of them were still on the roster at the end, if that. Um, but it was just, I mean, we had like five different kick returners they were bringing in just every week. Like, new kick wow. returner. Oh, he didn't do that great cut. I'm bringing in another guy. And like, you know, we had so many different um, pass rushers because we, we, we couldn't get sacks. So they just kept signing guys, trying to see if somebody could come in and get some pass uh uh, pass rushing, something. Uh, get something going, yeah, anything. Come yeah. on, yeah. Trying to get some pressure on the quarterback, and so they just, it, it was wild though, man. And um, and also just like your contracts aren't guaranteed, so you know everybody's not making the same amount of money. Like everybody's not having that fifty million dollar contract or or whatever it is. Like there's actually a huge disparity between the top guys in the league and the wow. bo bottom guys in yeah. the league. You know what I mean? And, and they've raised the the league minimum um since I I was playing, but it's a it's a huge gap. They're pretty much the middle class in the NFL, if you would say, has like disappeared. It's it's like either guys are making a lot of money or guys are pretty much getting like, you know, comparatively compared yeah. to the other guys are getting you know, the crumbs. Um, and they, they do the linebackers bad, man. I got to say that, bro. Like, <laughs> LVs get shown no love. Like, it's only maybe – I heard corners and DBs were the worst. But are you saying linebackers are probably the most under-respected? I, I, I think it's linebackers. Just because okay. the simple fact, like, we do – it. we're the quarterback of the defense. Yeah. And we play on every single special team. Like yeah. You don't have a linebacker on kickoff, kick return, punt, and punt 100%. return. 100%. Like, we're doing it all. And, you know, our bodies are banged up. We hitting and taking on, you know, blocks and all that. Like, and we get the crumbs compared to everybody else, bro. <laughs> wow. It's I remember they showed a breakdown on our team, like, which positions, like, got the most money and stuff. And I think the linebackers – I want to say either had the least or like the second second least. So wow, like, that's so interesting. It's it's yeah, it, it, it's bad, man. Like I was like, man, maybe I should have just stuck to safety, bro. <laughs> wow, I like to talk about mentorship and uh, sports. I mean, you literally have coaches that are not just a head coach, but you have position coaches and uh, offensive coordinators, defense, special teams. Were there any specific coaches? Because you're a coach now. So was there any specific coaches that maybe um, motivated you to become a coach? Or was it almost opposite? Like, oh, man, I wish I had a coach like this. And then now you're trying to embody the coach that you wish <laughs> you had. Like, I, it's so important for me in the business community and in, in parenthood, mm -hmm. fatherhood, being a spouse to be a mentor to people who are maybe newer than I am, but also yeah. to have mentorships and have that cyclical nature. So I'm interested in how you've applied that in your life. And we don't have to always keep it to sports. Like we can talk into, you know, your family and being, being right. a dad and a husband, but I just, I want to come out of that and just kind of hear your perspective, you know, coming from the, um, where you've come from. Yeah, man, it's it's a lot of people I got to give credit to. I would say 
um, as far as my career, my uh, strength coach in college at Mizzou, uh, Dr. Pat Ivey, he definitely nice. inspired me to, to get yeah. into business. Like, I mean, he was just so amazing, man. And, and what him and his staff did, they were so awesome. And, and I, I saw the value and how it transformed my thinking and my playing. And I wanted to be able to inspire and, and, and change young men as well. Um, because, you know, in college, I just always, I just always hated to see guys that had all the tools and then they just wasted it. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And, and there were guys I played with at Missouri that could have been for sure first round picks, man. Like not even exaggerating. Um, but you know, they were doing different things and ended up, you know, getting kicked off the team and whatnot. And that can change the trajectory of your family. Like, 100%. you know, you not becoming the person that God intended for you to become is going to affect other people that's dependent on you, you know? Wow. And so that always just touched my heart. And I just, it always made me sad to see that. And so I wanted to be able to, affect young men and inspire them to stay on the straight and narrow and to uh, live the abundant life that God has meant for all of us, you know, uh, to expand the territory that God has given them, you know. Um, so he inspired me to do that in this field because that's what he did. And I just thought it was awesome. And I'm, I was so thankful for, for what he did just as a man. Uh, he was more than a coach, you know. Um, he, he, he set the example and, uh, and, and showed us how it was done. Um, so it, it was him for that. And then I just had a ton of just great people I grew up with, you know, my father, um, people I went to church with that mentored me, you know, um, so mentors, are, they're incredibly important, man. Like, like you said, it's important to have mentors and to also pass it forward by giving it to somebody else and, and helping others. Um, and I, I definitely wouldn't be where I am without it. Like, um, it was a guy I went to church with growing up. He was like a financial advisor and stuff. So he kind of guided me once I made it to the league and putting the right seeds in my mind on how to manage my money and stuff. And, I tell you, there were cats that made way more money than me in the league, but they didn't walk away with as much as I did. Wow. And, you know, I was so thankful to have somebody like that that, that you know, uh, gave me the right perspective on things and, and had me thinking long term. And, uh, and so, yeah, it, it was incredibly powerful, man. Man. That is that is some stuff right there. That was that was great. I hope um, anybody that's that's listening can take some just some significant value from that and figure out how they can apply it. I'm curious, man. Um, what what gaps do you see in the athletic sphere? Um, I mean, you're at LSU now, and you've been in the college. Um, you've been coaching college for, for you know for a while. So as you see athletes come through college to the NFL, what are what are gaps? You know, what are opportunities that are missing when it comes to kind of stewarding these individuals as as they come up and they, you know, they might have been the best at their high school and they come in and now they're in college and then the ones that are successful and then can go on to the next level. Um, I can see it as very jarring. And you hear a lot about these guys that come and, you know, they get that first paycheck and they squander it. Um, so I'm just curious for you. And I'm on the outside and I've kind of had touch points in the industry just because of my connections. But I'm curious for somebody that's been in it and has seen people succeed and fail. Are there any systemic um, opportunities for growth or for somebody to come in and kind of help these guys? Are there any initiatives that you like? that are currently going on that maybe helped you? I try to tell guys that they need to invest in assets. You know what there I mean? We go. Like put your money towards something that's going to provide a long-term value for you. 
you know, you don't want to buy liabilities. You want to buy assets. Yeah. You know, um, so. Um, yeah, so it, it just goes down to financial education. Um, a lot of these guys come from environments where they didn't have anything, you know, and people in their family didn't have anything. And so they don't have that prior knowledge, you know, or, or somebody telling them, you know, what to do with it and and how they can make the money grow or anything like that. They just see money and their their mindset is I'm going to get things that I always wish I could have. And that's what they do. But like you said, it, it has to be a strong initiative to try to change that mindset. The, the reason I asked is I'm working on a thesis right now and kind of the trying to build out the avatar for this show. I've been in franchising for eight years. You know, I got my dad bought the rights to own and operate a Mosquito Joe franchise and mm -hmm. put me in a position to run the thing when I was 25 years old without knowing anything about anything about running a business. <laughs> and we're getting ready to integrate our, our next franchise brand. And I've got a GM now, I've got staff, I've got a team, and I'm moving into the franchise consulting space. And so the idea of like looking for people who have money but don't know what to do with it and I was just interested if there's anything there, and you said it perfectly, you know, buying assets. For me, I see these guys like Shaquille O'Neal, Drew Brees, Peyton yeah. Manning, and they're killing it in the franchise mm -hmm. space. They put their money towards these businesses and they build out these assets. So I was curious if there was anything like that already going on that you were aware of, because if not, I feel like I'm on to something. Oh <laughs> uh, well, we have a great um, director of player development here. Okay, uh, his name's Dr. Yeah, Arnold. Good. He does an awesome job by you know he'll talk to the players and he'll bring in people and, and things like that. Um, so so they do have education for sure. Um, I don't know the full extent of it to be honest, um, just because that's like you know a separate you know department from, yeah. from what I work in, but. I think it should be mandatory that every player, um, as soon as they come in, they should have to take a financial literacy class. Um, mm. I, I, I think that's something. Yeah, I, because I, it, that. I mean, it, it, it applies to everybody. You yeah. Know what I mean? And I, I think it's sad that we don't teach about money in schools. You know, we don't teach about credit cards, balancing checkbooks, investing in the stock market. Um, all of those things of uh, buying a house, you know, what's the process of, of buying a house and all of that stuff. Like, uh, those are things that people just, most people got to learn on the fly. And, and if 100%. you don't have any family members that's been through that stuff, then, you know what I mean? You're just, it, it, it's tough to learn all that stuff. Um, and so I, I think it should be mandatory for sure. And I think that will, help, you know, aid guys. You no, know, guys are still going to do what they want to do to a certain extent. Right. You'll have more more people that would do it um, than not, for sure. Yeah, um, I think once you see people experiencing success as well, mm -hmm. doing things differently, and there's something attractive about that, then I think that's good. What up? Yeah. All right, so we're running, we're running uh, close on time. We got about five minutes left. Um, but I want to ask you, what has what has becoming a husband and becoming a father done for your growth, specifically in the context of being a leader? Because that's exactly what you are. You're a spiritual leader. You're a leader of your family. But also, you're a leader on this team, and you've been that way for as long as I've known you. So how has that specific event of becoming a husband and then becoming a father, how has that altered your perspective as you lead other men and individuals and teams? Man, it, it's just made me better because, you know, I want to be the best for my children. And uh, I try to treat these young men the same way that I would treat my own children, you know. And so I, I try to give them that same love, the same advice, you know, um, push them to, to that level of excellence that they can achieve. Um, but being a father, that's been one of the greatest things that's ever happened to me 
it's it's um like you said you got to be better because kids pick up on everything they're watching you gotta every be. move <laughs> you know what yeah. i mean so um i just try to be how my spiritual father and god is you know um so it, it's forced me to study the word more and how god is with me i try to treat my children the same way you know, I know I need patience and I know I need mercy and I need grace. And so I try to extend that, you know, to my children as well. And it, it's incredibly hard. You know, I, I don't always get it right for sure. But um, I think I do get it right more often than not. And uh, it's been a great experience so far, man. I'm, I'm super excited to continue watching them grow up and and blossom and uh so it's been awesome. Man, amen. Having kids is a beautiful thing. They bring out the best and the worst in you. And they <laughs> are consistently challenging you and sharpening that sharpening that saw, man. Um, have you found any other like groups or communities that are um that help kind of build a foundation around what you're doing now. Yeah, I know coaching can be, I know you're on a team, but um, divorce rates are pretty high. It could be pretty isolating. Do you have any like tools or resources or communities that you find are helpful to kind of stay centered and stay focused on what's really important? Um, like church groups. Yeah, um, okay. I know my wife and I, when we were in Dallas, we were very involved with our um, church group. Uh, but since we've moved, um, we kind of bounce around churches here, but we finally found one. And so we're nice. getting plugged in there more and more. Um, but I also, I, I try to, I read a lot. So I try to read a book. That's what books you reading right now, man? What books you reading right now? That was my <laughs> next one. I got to throw it in before we run out of time. Come on, hit me. So, so I listen, I, I listen to a lot of books like audio. Yeah. Um, so I'll listen to like a marriage book. It's one by Tony Evans. Okay. Um, what a kingdom man. Yeah. Yeah. So I listen to that one. And then it's another one called point man. Okay. Um, I can't remember the author to that one, but it's actually really good. It, it's, it, I think he's a pastor in like Chicago or something like that, Okay. but it, it's really good. So I listen. I, I listen to that, and then you know I'll listen to like um, inspirational stuff, like stories, autobiography sometimes, and then you know I'll read like a book that's gonna help me be a better coach and stuff. So nice. Um, I try to get a little bit of knowledge in you know in, in different spaces and rooms, uh, but yeah, I think it's important, like just like you're trying to advance in your profession or, you know, advance in your education, getting a degree and stuff. You have to put that same kind of energy into your marriage and, and, and being a father as well. Like that's one of the most important things, if not the most important thing, that role that you will have here on earth, you know? Um, and so you got to take care of your household before you can do anything else. And no doubt. Um, so, I think that's, uh, you know, families are the backbone of society, man. So I just I just want my kids to have the best life and, and, and to thrive. And so we do a ton of fun stuff, man, but I, I also make sure I teach them and, and, and I, I make it fun, you know, don't try to yeah. burden them with it. But, you know, I, I got big plans of, you know, trying to expose them to different things. So. Yeah. Oh, that's what's yeah. up, man. Yeah, Tony Evans, um, that Kingdom Man is a good book. That was a required reading when I was at Wheaton College, man. We had to read that thing every year. And he actually <laughs> did, uh, he did Brooke and I's marriage counseling right before we got married. He was supposed to marry us. 
he had a scheduling conflict like two weeks before. And so we had to Dang. find a new person to, to marry us. Dude, I remember walking up into that church and I thought I was, might as well have been meeting the president, man. I mean, that was a huge <laughs> church. He had to go through so many layers. All right, so I'm going to close it out. Xavier, appreciate you so much for hopping on. I would love to have you on again and we can get a little more granular in some specific areas, things that I didn't get to hit. But dude, thank you so much. Um, I got one thing left to say, man. Stay humble, stay hungry, stay streetwise. Peace. Hey, appreciate you, man. Glad to be here. All right, let's go. You've been at LSU now for two years? Yeah. This, this is the second, second year? Man. Yeah. Okay. When did you get, when did you start? Um, December of 21. So, yeah, it was real weird because I worked the regular season. I was at SC, and then for the bowl game, I was here. So, <laughs> it was like I was with a whole other team, and then I coached the bowl for somebody else. So, it was, it was a little different. Um, wow. I've always wondered what that experience like because you see coaches do that all the time. Yeah. Right? But I never realized like what it was like in in person. Did you get? Are there like headhunters for coaches? How did you just get hired to a whole nother school across the country? Um, no, it is it's basically like networking and connections. So, uh, I interned at Notre Dame in 2018, right. and so obviously the entire staff here came from Notre Dame. And so, why, why know, is that? Because the, the coach, yeah, Coach Kelly and the um, head oh, strength coach okay. Jake Flint. So whenever they came over, then they offered me a position, and it was like it was a, a tremendous blessing because you know at SC we were all getting fired at the end of the year, <laughs> and so <laughs> anyway, it was like, so nobody was going to be on the squad anyway. Yeah, so it was crazy because, you know, they hired Lincoln, Lincoln Riley. So, and then we didn't make a bowl. Yeah, exactly. And then we didn't make a bowl that year. So then it was like I got a new job and got to, you know, work a bowl game. And so it just all fell in place, man. Like, yeah, it was a tremendous blessing for sure.